I sign those as a true record. Councillor Daniel Cook. Happy to move that we move the minutes, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rob Pritchard. Second that, Mr Chairman. Okay, so the minutes have been moved by Councillor Daniel Cook and seconded by Councillor Rob Pritchard. All those in favour? That's uni unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, item three on the agenda is declarations of interest. I'm not aware of any. Does anybody have anything to raise now? No. In that case, we'll move straight on to agenda item four, which is question time. Uh, and I'm pleased that after uh, quite a long time, actually, uh, we've got some questions uh, from members of the public. So the first question is from uh, Mr. Loxton. Would you like to ask your question? Thank you. What arrangements are in place to reopen the offices of Tamworth Borough Council so members of the public can access face-to-face -face help and when can we expect them to be reopened? Thank you, Mr Loxton. Uh, Councillor Marie Bailey, would you like to respond? Thank you. Um, Tamworth Borough Council, through our officers and elected members, are working hard to protect staff, services and the people of Tamworth ensuring our most vulnerable, vulnerable residents are, remain a high priority. Since the pandemic began, the council has continued to deliver services to all our residents, albeit sometimes needing to deliver them in a different way due to the restrictions. We have listened to our customers and where they have not been able to access services in the way that we would normally do, we've adapted our processes so that we are able to fulfil their requirements. We are pleased to announce that no formal complaints from customers have been received regarding access to our services during these unprecedented times. What I would say, data on how customers access services have, has been collated and analysed and there is a clear trend that residents are increasingly accessing our services via email and other digital means. And in the last year, the number of web chats with customers has increased by 304%. Emails increased by 71%, with telephone calls decreasing by 6.4%. And in addition, the Repairs con Contact Centre handled 24,153 telephone calls and 4,639 email inquiries. As a council, we are committed to providing a face-to-face -face service for our residents and will do so in line with the government guidance. Given the Prime Minister's announcement on Monday the 14th of June, Tamworth Borough Council will continue to deliver the services in the way we have since the pandemic began. However, officers are currently reviewing the way we will deliver front-facing customer service in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Uh, do you have a supplementary, Mr. Mr. Loxon? Yes, please. Um, it seems wrong that I can come in to the council offices tonight to this meeting, yet, for example, a homeless person couldn't come into the council offices to get help with homelessness advice. Could, could you not be offering a face-to-face -face appointment where they book it through email or over the phone? And can you confirm whether the Tamworth Advice Centre, which is obviously citizens' advice, which is based in the offices, offer face-to-face -face appointments to those vulnerable residents that you speak about? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Loxton. Uh, Councillor Bailey. So, at the minute, I believe appointments can be made but obviously through special contact through the customer services centre um, with regard to the other question I'll if it's okay with you I'll come back to you with a written response within two to three days thank you okay, okay thank you very much for that uh, and that brings us on to question two which is from uh, Mr Tony Madge unfortunately uh, Mr Madge can't be in attendance this evening so Andrew Barrett, the Chief Exec, will read Mr Madge's question on his behalf. Thank you, Chairman. Um, question from Tony Madge, um, which is to be asked in, in three parts. Uh, with regard to the recent traveller encampments on Stonydale, I would like to ask why, when the Council had a Section 61 notice to enforce, the removal, this was not carried out with police assistance, and instead another costly court case was initiated which also delayed for local residents the removal of travellers. A cost of £100,000 has been mentioned for the clean-up of the site and surrounding area. Does this amount include the legal cost and also where is this money coming from and what services will be at risk with this large amount of money having to be spent in cleaning up after the travellers? Finally, 
If the money was in reserve for such incident instances, why can we not look at using it for low-cost, effective method of stopping egress onto open land owned by Tamworth Borough Council? Wooden posts that are not obtrusively high, but high enough to disable access onto open land by caravans, etc., yet still allow small maintenance and grass cutter vehicles access. These posts can be concreted into the ground, making removal difficult, and if they are damaged to aid removal, this will be an offence of criminal damage under Section 1.1 of the Criminal Damage Act 1971. Will the Council look at this request, including any other methods of deterrent, so that illegal parking and traveller encampments can be stopped, giving not only peace of mind for the residents, but also saving valuable resources and the high cost of clearing up after they have moved on? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barrett, uh, and pass on my thanks to, uh, to Mr. Madge for asking the question. Um, so, Section 61 uh, of the Criminal Justice Act, uh, sorry, Public Order Act, gives the police discretionary powers to remove trespassers from land, but there are strict conditions on when this power can be used, and the council cannot require the police to use these powers. Uh, I was uh, in, a, in a meeting earlier this week uh, and heard an example of a, a nearby authority uh, where a Section 61 was served by the police service uh, against 20 vehicles uh, who left that particular site and set up five other unauthorised encampments within the same borough. Uh, so all of a sudden they've gone from a single site to manage to, to five separate ones. Uh, so, so there's various feedback on those. Each time the council deals uh, with illegal encampments, uh, we liaise closely with the police uh, our colleagues and establish uh, whether, whether they're able to use that power. Uh, in relation to the recent encampment at Stonydolph, the police were not able to use a Section 61, and after carrying out the, the mandatory welfare checks, uh, the Council issued the direction of the encampments to leave the land uh, by de designated time uh, and date under, the se under Section 77 of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act 94. Uh, where this was not complied with, the council then had to make a, an application to the magistrate's court to secure cor a court order, uh, and unfortunately this process can, can take some time as it has to uh, secure a, a, a court hearing uh, and then serve summons on the encampment. Once the court order has been secured, uh, sorry, had been secured, it was served immediately uh, on the encampment and we worked with bailiffs and police uh, to enforce that court order. The second point that's raised uh, around the cost of £100,000, um, I'd like to know where that figure came from uh, and, and, and the, the context of that. Uh, we're not aware of where that figure came from or the source of that figure, uh, and the clean-up of, uh, of the Lintley site uh, in reality took two days and five members of staff with four vehicles to clean the site, and approximately five tonnes of waste were removed from that site. Uh, a further two members of staff uh, were used to jet wash and sanitise the area. The total clean-up cost for Lintley was £1,987, which is of street scenes time. So this is included within our normal operating budget. Uh, so the, the members of staff involved uh, in cleaning that site would have been cleaning up other areas of the town uh, as opposed to this one. So it was a shift of resource rather than an additional cost. The legal costs uh, associated with the court, court hearing uh, and the paperwork, etc., uh, are covered within our, uh, our existing budgets with the shared service we have uh, for legal services with, uh, with South Staffordshire. Uh, the cost of the bailiffs is, uh, is still awaited as we haven't had the invoice from them. Uh, in terms of the, the last part of the question, I've moved away from the mic, sorry. In terms of the last part of the question, uh, it does relate to, to the figure uh, that was perceived to have been spent. Uh, as we haven't spent that figure, it sort of skews that, that part of it. Um, we have been reviewing our open spaces uh, and we're going to have a, a compre comprehensive uh, review in relation to, uh, to access for unauthorised encampments uh, and we're going to have a, a further discussion as to how we can better manage the process in, in future. Uh, I assume you haven't got a, a supplementary, Mr Barrett? There is no supplementary, uh, Mr Chairman, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes the questions at Cabinet this evening. Um, item five on the agenda 
is matters referred to the Cabinet in accordance with overview and scrutiny procedure rules. There are none reported. However, the next item on the agenda did go through uh, infrastructure safety and growth on Tuesday uh, this week. Uh, and as a result, I've invited Councillor Simon Goodall to speak on the next item at the appropriate time. Uh, so, so if you could just wait patiently, we'll get to it. Um, so agenda item six is the future high street fund uh, terms of reference. Um, now, this is, this is about the terms of reference and about the timeline. Uh, but it'd be remiss of me to miss this opportunity uh, to remind people of, of where we've come from uh, and where we're going with the Future High Street Fund. Uh, Future High Street Fund is the borough council's, one of the borough council's uh, attempts at regenerating uh, the town centre. And we know the town centre, like many other places, has struggled for a number of years. Uh, and we know this is partly because the retail boom of 14, 50 years ago uh, seems to be coming to an end. Uh, and behaviours and demands are changing. Now, it's very easy to come up with some very simple answers to the challenges of the town centre. And they're easy and simple when they're based on assumptions. But what we need to remember is the council does not control private rent. The council does not control the rates and the, and, and the level of rates that are paid. More importantly, the council does not control people's behavior. It doesn't control what people buy. It doesn't control what businesses want to sell. So once we remove all that, these simple answers suddenly become a little bit more complex. What councils do control is the environment and the conditions for a healthy town centre. And we know if we want a growing local economy, we need to create the right conditions and the right environments. We also know that high streets need one thing to thrive and that is people. Whether they're shopping, whether they're enjoying themselves, relaxing, whether they're working, whether they're there for social interaction, it doesn't matter. They need people in them to thrive. And if we get the right people in the town centre and more people in the town centre, then we will drive inv investment and local business will thrive. And this is why we support the, the college's plans uh, to move to the town centre. That places thousands of students and hundreds of staff in the heart of the town centre. It's about people being there. Now, we, I'll, I'll cover that next point. Now, we started this process in 2019, and Councillor Daniel Cook started with the Tamworth What's Next project consultation. Uh, and we, we took that and created a, a, a list of uh, around 10 strategic points that we wanted to pick up on. And we used those in our bid for Future High Street Fund. And I think there's a there's seven, maybe eight of those that are explicitly listed within the Future High Street Fund bid. Uh, so, so that was where we, where, we came, where we started from. And that consultation included members of the public, uh, local businesses, and also the, uh, the voluntary sector in, in, in Tamworth. So we put that together. That produced uh, five key projects uh, within the Future High Street Fund bid. Uh, as I mentioned, the relocation of the the college into the town centre, uh, the refurbishment of the listed part of the co-op uh, that fronts uh, uh, that fronts Coal Hill uh, into into an enterprise centre to boost the offer we've got uh, with the Phil Dick Centre and also forge links with those leaving the college. Uh, there was also the enhancement of the area around the Castle Gatehouse and Market Street properties uh, and breathe some life back into those, uh, and the refurbishment and demolition of parts of middle entry, uh, including the introduction of new semi-permanent structures for startups and niche businesses. If there's one thing, I'm hoping Danny Cook will, will support me on, if there's one thing that we heard all the way through the consultation and every night we were in here with the public or the, or, or the businesses or the community groups, it was that demand for niche shops or, or niche markets. Uh, and there's also uh, the, the, the final part of that is the refurbishment of uh, St. Elitha Square. Uh, and in terms of casting my mind back, uh, one of the things that was key to that was people were suggesting that we've got a town centre, but where's the centre? Where's the, the focal point? Uh, so we've encompassed that into St. Editha's Square. Um, the document goes on to explain the terms of reference, uh, the programme board, where we fit into it uh, as, as members and who that reports back to. Uh, and beneath that sits the programme delivery team. 
the other thing that's included in the report is a, an indicative timeline. I think it's on page three of the report. Uh, an indicative timeline of what we're going to see when from the project. The really frustrating and disappointing thing is this bit's all about getting governance in place and getting the right people in place and the right suppliers. So we're not seeing any nice big grand plans or, or bulldozers rocking up until until next year. Uh, so, so whilst it's a uh, it's almost the boring part. It's the it's the, the getting things in order before the before the the excitement, uh, and that clearly so so those pages clearly demonstrate the the timeline uh, in terms of delivering this project and spending the government funding by the end of March 2024. So with that, I will ask uh, Andrew Barrett if he's got anything to add before I move over to Councillor uh, Goodall. Thank you, Chairman. I, I, I think you've summarised the, the report um, well. Um, nothing, nothing to add. It's it's a very good news story. It's a very challenging timeline. I think it probably is worth saying. Um, but the the, the 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 fundamental difference it will make to the town is uh, is absolutely needed. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you very, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, Councillor Goodall, did you want to pick up any points that you were? Uh, discussed that scrutiny on Tuesday. Uh, yes, please. Um, and thanks for inviting me uh, to your cabinet meeting. Um, so we had a full full discussion on Tuesday night. Um, we we did seek some some clarification in a in a few areas. Um, happy for me to just just run through those. Um, so the the actual work program. Um, as, as you've already mentioned, was indicative. We just wanted a little bit of clarification that once it was firmed up, that um, that could be reported to, to committee um, against that baseline plan. Um, we also seek clar clarification on the, the status of the college funding, um, where that was and what impact that would have on um, on the program as a whole, um, we we also, as far as reporting on the progress of the uh, of the program, um, we just wanted confirmation that yes, it would come back to to scrutiny on a on a four weekly basis uh, on a four four yearly quarterly basis quarterly basis. Um, but some flexibility around that, depending on what was what information was was forthcoming at that time. Um, so we were pleased about that. Um, we were in quite interested in how um, skills as a wider um, topic, um, with regards to the college, could be um, impacted by the council. Um, and uh, I, I know you, you, you made a number of comments re re with regard to that, and I think um, it's perhaps something that will go on a, on a, a wider scrutiny agenda through, through one of the committees. Um, and we also just wanted to check that the archaeology was being, uh, being looked after and that there was going to be some input from, from the county archaeologist to, uh, to provide some guidance there. Um, other than that, we, we noted the report, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, you, we've been able to give you some, some feedback and some comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Goodall. I'm not going to pick up all the, the points you've raised there, but um, uh, I, I was pleased to hear that. <coughs> excuse me. I was pleased to hear that you're going to look at uh, discussing with the college the, the offer. Uh, as well, uh, and like I said, it, we we can get involved and create the right environment and, and conditions, uh, but but it's not up to us to deliver those courses. So so I'm pleased that you that you're taking that up as a as a scrutiny function uh, and, and an investigation. Um, also, pick up, I will pick up on the point uh, uh, around the college funding. Uh, we must remember that the government funding is 21.65 million. This project probably going to cost around 40 million uh, and, and that will be funded by our, par our partners, us, other investments, other contributions. Uh, so so it's, uh, it's, it's important that we, we recognise that, that that figure is broken down uh, uh, over, over partners and not just sits, uh, sits at our door to, to find, the, uh, f find that gap. Uh, Councillor Daniel Cook indicated. Thank you very much Mr Leader. 
uh, been remiss of me not to say something on this item, as you mentioned me quite <laughs> a little bit in your opening. Um, you know, me, me and you have had a running joke about this project for a little while. Um, I was leader uh, when we was awarded this money. You were the portfolio holder. We've naturally switched positions. But it was just to give you credit, um, you know, as much as I claim it, because I was leader of the council at the time, it was your hard work and your running with some fantastic officer input that got us this money. And it is worth remembering how hard yourself and the officers worked to get us this grant from government and the opportunity that is there before us. Obviously, I just want to echo what you said, Mr. Chairman. Um, if you think about what this council is currently undertaking and, and has undertaken, when we talk about the assembly rooms and the public realm around the assembly rooms, when we talk about future high streets fund, which is going from the town hall right through St. Edith's Square to the co-op building, and in future we talk about the Gungate opportunity, this council is changing the face of this town centre for the better. It is modernising it, it is bringing it into the 21st century, but as you rightly say, Mr Chairman, many times, we can't run the businesses for the businesses. It's time now, and I take on this challenge with the cabinet position you've given me, which is to get the businesses in a room and say, how are you going to take this opportunity? How are you going to position your businesses correctly to take advantage of this new design, modern town centre, while protecting heritage the council has given you? We've done our part. I don't think we could have done any more. Well, as you correctly say, we don't control the rents. We don't control the business rates. Some would argue we control the car parking rates. But actually, there is no evidence out there whatsoever that shows that charging £2 for car parking prevents people visiting somewhere. It's about the offer. People pay £10 to park in the centre of Birmingham because what they want is there. That's what we've got to crea collectively create on the back of this project and the other projects, which is a town centre, yet again, that is fit for the 21st century and actually draws in visitors and our residents to use it the way it was supposed to be used. It is going to change. It isn't going to be like the early 1980s in the retail boom. The world has moved on. We need to embrace it as a council, and our businesses and our residents need to embrace it as well. And if we can collectively come together with some good consultation, we can deliver something phenomenal with these opportunities. So I just want to say thank you again, Mr Chairman. Uh, your work as portfolio holder and the officers have fetched us a fantastic opportunity, and I really look forward to seeing it unfold. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Any other questions or comments? No, in which case, uh, support your point about thanking the officers uh, for the work they've done and the work they're still doing. There's a, a significant amount of pressure on, on the team, uh, the team that are delivering this uh, and, and they've got to deliver it. In terms of the, the public engagement, like I said, this is, a, this is the boring sort of part uh, before we start seeing things happen. Um, but of course, when we get to design, design stage and planning stage, there'll be full consultation which uh, which, we're, which which will go through and, and involve the public and the businesses in in shaping what things look like and make sure we don't lose the lessons of the past and we modernize but we also modernize in a in an appropriate way uh, and we're not losing our, our identity and our, and our story uh, so with that I would like to move uh, that we approve the the report the terms of reference uh, and that we approve the indicative program timeline in accordance with those terms of reference. Could I have a seconder? Councillor Rob Pritchard has seconded. All those in favour? That is unanimous again. Thank you very much. Thank you for your input. Moving on to agenda item seven is the council housing garage sites. Councillor Rob Pritchard. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, the council own uh, a number of garage sites across the borough. Uh, some sites are well occupied and popular. However, that's usually the exception, not the norm. Uh, one thing that many of our other sites had in common um, was declining use or a need uh, of investment. Over the past 15 years, the authority's been looking at our garage sites and how we can make best use of them. Uh, and many sites over the years have been cleared and some sites developed for social housing, uh, some repaired and some sites cleared for residence parking. However, the most of the decisions we made in the past were actually sort of low-hanging low fruit. They were popular decisions with local residents uh, and generally welcomed uh, by everybody involved. Um, that meant that a lot of the sites we've had left in the last few years have been more challenging, either through desirability, letting, rate, uh, letting rates, uh, condition of the sites, their size, their layouts, their proximity to the community. So the authority started looking at uh, these sites and uh, I'll admit we made a, a few mistakes a few years ago. So we went back to the drawing board again and, and looked at how best we can use some of these sites to make best use of taxpayers' assets. Um, and we've now uh, got to the process we're at today with a recommendation of what to do with our remaining sites. Um, 
the report represents uh, the end, if not the beginning of the end of this journey um, over many decades and provides a definitive answer on what we'll be doing with uh, some of the remaining garage sites. Um, a small number lend themselves to other uses. Uh, a number will be repaired, uh, invested in and, and brought back to uh, good condition. Uh, a number will be cleared for parking. So there's a range of options in there. Um, and there's also uh, a desire to, to build, again, social housing on some sites. Um, we will also work to improve the marketing and ease of letting a garage uh, in hopes of increasing the letting rates across the borough. And finally, we'll also look to install a significant number of electric vehicle charging points on some of these sites, uh, which I hope will be welcomed by residents. Um, I'd like to draw members' attention to the appendices. There's a, a full list there of, of the remaining sites. So this report doesn't affect all sites in the borough because there's a number we've already repaired or, or invested in or, or used for other uses. These are, are the remaining sites. And there is a slight error on the formatting of one of the appendices. I apologize for that. Um, but there's a full list in there uh, if members want it. Um, so I draw their members' attention to the five recommendations, which really uh, is, I think, everybody uh, clearly defines what we'll be doing. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions from cabinet members. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr Weston, do you want to add anything at this point? Uh, not a great deal, to be honest with you. I think taking some, uh, taking some of the lessons learned from the past, we recognise that communications with the local residents is going to be key to this one. So we have developed as part of this, and whilst it's not part of the recommendations, it is in the report, uh, a detailed communications plan, sort of both high level and site level. Uh, so that that will be communicated out to those affected residents, but also will heavily involve ward members in that process. Uh, so I think that that's probably a, a very important part for us on that one. Uh, and as Councillor Pritchard says, obviously there are a number of sites that are excluded from this because we've done work in the past, uh, in particular where we've got garages underneath properties or uh, directly attached to properties, those are excluded from this program because most of those now will have had uh, replacement doors and some level of refurbishment and, and those where they're under properties will have had insulation done in the past as well uh, so that's why those are excluded uh, so it's not mentioned in there but that's why they're excluded from it okay thank you okay thank you very much are there any questions councillor daniel cook uh, thank you mr chairman not a question as such as quick comment which is to thank councillor pritchard and mr weston uh, i've said this a few times to a few colleagues recently I think this is a demonstration of this council doesn't think it's perfect and we, we are capable of learning lessons. It's not something we got perfect the first time around, but there is an open willingness to be a learning council and actually see where we made those mistakes. And I really do welcome this report. Thank Councillor Pritchard, thank Mr. Weston. And again, thank you for the comment about, it's about communication. It's exactly what it is. Really do welcome this, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Councillor Pritchard. Yep, uh, thank you for those comments. I think one thing we're very keen to ensure is we're keeping everybody informed of what's happening. So uh, the, the residents around sites where there'll be a change of use will be kept up to speed. Ward members will be kept up to speed. And also those that um, may find that we're going to have to relocate them to an adjacent site, again, are kept up to speed. So everybody knows what's happening at each step. Um, and that should hopefully remove any further obstacles down the road because everybody does feel informed and aware of what's happening. Okay, thank you very much. Any further questions or comments? No. Councillor Pritchard, have you moved those five recommendations? Uh, they've been moved. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Dan uh, Councillor Steve Doyle uh, se seconded those. Uh, all those in favour? Okay, again, that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, move on to item eight, which is the Tamworth Community Safety Partnership Plan uh, to 2021 update. Councillor Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The purpose of the report is to endorse the annual refresh of the Tamworth Community Safety Partnership Plan. In summary, a comprehensive community safety strategic assessment is undertaken in Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Trent every three years, and an annual update is undertaken in the remaining two years. This process is undertaken in each district or borough uh, authority. The Tamworth Community Safety Plan for 2020-2023 three-year rolling plan outlines how partners are going to collectively tackle community safety issues in the Tamworth Borough. The 2021 re refresh highlights that what has been achieved against the outcomes set in the previous year and to outline priorities moving forward identified in the community st safety strategic assessment. Details are contained within the appendices. 
The coronavirus pandemic has had an unprecedented, unprecedented impact on services and we have seen an unprecedented shift in demand. As a result, the data in this year's annual uh, Community Safety Strategic Assessment re uh, Refresh Report is irregular and the observations and analysis should be considered in the context of the coronavirus pandemic and its impact on normal day-to-day -day life. Restrictions imposed as part of the government approach aimed at controlling the coronavirus pandemic have resulted in significant reductions in recorded crime and disorder from mid-March 2020 onwards. The 2021 Community Safety Refresh Plan is attached in Appendix 1 and has been through scrutiny committee on the 25th of March 2021 and has been recommended for endorsement by Cabinet prior to publication on the Tamworth Borough Council webpage. Although Tamworth Borough Council is the lead partner, the plan is by all key and statutory and voluntary partners and the partnership continues to work together to reduce crime and antisocial behaviour to improve public perception, well-being and community safety in Tamworth. So my recommendation to Cabinet members is to consider and endorse the Tamworth Community Safety Plan 2021 refresh. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Councillor Doyle. Any questions or comments from other Cabinet members? No? Oh, you got away with that, Councillor Doyle. Um, I was just going to say, if, if you look at the plan, there's, a, th there's some quite low-level things in there, but there are also some quite significant challenges uh, in that, so, you know, so, so we go from talking about uh, public space to, to county lines and, and, and domestic abuse. There's a whole, a whole lot of things that, that this keys into uh, on, on a whole spectrum of, of significance. And so it's, it's quite comprehensive. Yes, um, and to be honest, that's what you would expect from the report. I'd also like to thank uh, Jo Sands for the effort and time that she's put into generating this. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, there are no further questions or comments. Did you move the recommendation? You did. Um, yes, I did. In that case, um, the recommendation has been moved. Do we have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Marie Bailey. Um, all those in favour? Okay, that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the agenda this evening. So thank you for your time, and I will close the meeting there. Thank you.